and welcome to another exciting episode of Peep and Eep, an educational video series where we discuss an Ethereum improvement proposal, upcoming upgrades, and the basics of Ethereum blockchain. I'm Pooja Ranjan, and today we are going to discuss EIP 4895 Beacon Chain Push Withdrawals as Operations with one of the co-authors. EIP 4895 is a standard track core EIP proposed last month uh, and is currently in the draft status. A bit more on the background. Uh, we know Beacon Chain was launched on December 1st, 2020. It enabled staking on Ethereum. Validators can participate in network security, receive rewards for duties performed. However, collecting the reward in terms of withdrawing it to an individual's wallet is not there yet. To learn more on validator, staking, and available options for Beacon Chain withdrawal, we are joined by a very special guest and the co-author of the proposal, Alex Stokes. Thank you for joining, Alex. Yeah, thanks for having me, Pooja. I'm excited to talk about withdrawals today. Right. Um, as we all know, Alex has been on our show earlier talking about Beacon Chain accounting reform with Altair upgrade, uh, EIP 44s. So people, if you have missed watching all those episodes earlier, please check it out, especially episode 34, accounting reform, because that may provide a bit more context of what we are going to discuss today. Well, from uh, Alex's last tweet, uh, it's it's obvious that we there are a lot to share with the community. So uh, let's peep in. Great. Uh, let's see. I can go ahead and share my screen. So let's see. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, today uh, we'll be talking about beacon chain withdrawals. Hopefully, I'll give some context so that you understand what that even means by the end. And as we'll see, what we'll get to is that the current execution uh, sort of spec or upgrade. Uh, is captured by EIP 4895, so I put it here on the slide. Uh, but I did want to take some time today to like walk through kind of this whole narrative of how we got here, because there's actually a bunch of design decisions that went into this. Uh, and I think it's pretty interesting just to like see the whole, whole space and how things shaped up. So uh, yeah, we'll just dive in. So just quickly, who am I? Fuji gave a great intro. Uh, I'm a researcher at the F, Alex Stokes. If you want to find me on like I think probably any platform you can think of, I have the same handle. So yeah, email me. Well, I guess you could email. Anyway, DM me, message me, whatever. Uh, I think you should really get in touch with me. Uh, okay, so, right. <clears throat> We're talking about beacon chain withdrawals. And so like, before we even get into the details, it's like, well, what are we even withdrawing? So this is generally, uh, you know, viewing Ethereum after the merge. Uh, I'm sure there's some other EIP that will go in, or sorry, some other peep and eep that would go into like what the merge is and why it's so exciting and all of this. Uh, for today's conversation, all we'll say is that we're moving Ethereum from its current proof of work state to a proof of stake uh, network. And what this will look like is now there's multiple layers to the stack. Um, you kind of have these same layers today, but they're switched together. And so it's a little harder to pull them apart, but they get a little bit more pulled apart uh, with the merge. And there's two like important layers that we'll look at, the consensus layer and the execution layer. And so Pooja mentioned the beacon chain, that's the consensus layer. This is, uh, you know, a way to think about it is, um, well, and it is right now its own blockchain, but all it's doing is like forming this proof of state consensus. Um, then separately, there's like the Ethereum that everyone, you know, is probably very familiar with. Uh, I'll refer to it like kind of specifically as like the EVM as like this like user space execution environment. Um, and yeah, so either way, after the merge, these two things kind of become one thing, the full merge chain, uh, but there's still these layers. And so uh, we have this proof of stick network. What does that mean? Um, it refers again to the consensus where now you have these things called validators. Validators are validating the consensus. That's why we call them that. Um, and these are the actors on the network who are actually determining, okay, what's the canonical chain? Uh, if you're familiar with proof of work, right? There's like miners and a, a miner basically gets to vote for the next block in the chain by mining on top of it. Uh, there's a very similar mechanism in proof of stake uh, where a validator can propose the next block in the chain, but then also validators essentially vote off on like the, the correct chain according to their view of the network. Following the rules of consensus. 
Um, they get rewarded for this. And that's again, where we'll get to withdrawals because now there's gonna be this like reward element for doing your, your duty correctly. Um, but it's very important to actually the security model of this consensus that there's something at risk. Uh, you know, like I said here, asset, assets at risk. Uh, you know, this is when they say proof of stake, this is what they mean is the stake. There's like something that is valuable to you that is basically going to make sure that you have quote skin in the game. And that's like your deterrent because if you do something, uh, you know, that the protocol deems bad, then you can lose this locked up asset. Um, and, you know, on Ethereum, we have ETH, so this is the thing. And what this looks like is that in order to actually participate as one of these validators on the network, um, sort of within the protocol, you have to lock up 32 ETH, that's the current number, 32. And a way to think about it is sort of like a deposit into some bank account. And like I kind of said a second ago, if you do things that the protocol likes, namely forming consensus, validating the, you know, after the merge, validating the EVM rules, all of this, making sure that the protocol is behaving as we want, uh, then the protocol also gives you some, you know, some reward. So you get extra ETH uh, for doing so, for doing so well. And the way to think about this is that it's kind of like interest on this deposit that you made. So, right, we just, we just constructed this environment where you can do this thing, you can be a validator of, of the Ethereum network, and you basically get some ETH. And so eventually you're going to want this ETH, right? Um, and so this is what we mean when we're talking about withdrawing things is we're, we're drawing this ETH back to a place where we can use it, let's say in some DeFi application or, I don't know, some NFT drop. People do all sorts of things with Ether these days, but uh, ultimately, right, they're going to want it. So the question is like, how do we move it back from the consensus layer to the execution layer? Maybe I didn't make that point super clear, but you know, when I do say lock over here, I mean very specifically, it's, it's sort of locked on the this consensus layer, and uh, you know, in order to like use it freely, you need to move it back to the execution layer. So this is what I mean when we say beacon chain withdrawals. The beacon chain is this blockchain that's facilitating the consensus layer. Uh, again, post merge, they kind of become one thing. Uh, but right, so validator withdrawals might be a more uh, sort of you know total total phrase. Either way, hopefully it's not clear what we're trying to do. You have validators who lock up their ETH and they hopefully get some you know some more ETH for doing well, and then they want to withdraw that ETH. And so now the question is like, okay, this sounds like something we want. Like, how are we going to pull it off? How do we implement it? And it turns out there's like actually a pretty big design space and like over several like iterations of awkward devs and like different things like this, we've explored uh, the trades off the trade offs in this space. And I think, you know, there's certainly like a favorite solution. And so that's where we'll get to. Um, I want to take some time to walk through some of this design process just to give you a flavor for it. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll end up sort of where we're at now. We want to implement these like beacon chain withdrawals. And there's basically three sort of like top level, like big questions. The first one, when is a validator even allowed to withdraw? So I kind of hinted it was like very important for like network security that you know the ETH in this consensus layer has some sort of encumbrances. Like there are there are special rules around when it can do what. Uh, so we need to make sure that it's safe to even withdraw the ETH in the first place. Second question is okay if we do you know the protocol then deems it's safe to withdraw this ETH like how do we signal that because uh some of this is conditional on understanding kind of how the merge architecture is but basically there is a separation between these two layers uh that I've been sort of establishing or talking about and so we have to like figure out how to get from one to the other so we need to signal that somehow and then this is kind of a sub question but it gets tied in I mean, it's, it's very important, so it's it's uh, worth calling out on its own. Um, essentially, it's like, how do you do the actual accounting of the ETH, right? So, you know, if we had some withdrawal mechanism and there is like a faulty way to account for which ETH was moved where, then you could inflate the supply or something, that would be very, very bad. Uh, so we need to address that. So the first question, like, when do you actually want to withdraw? Um, and I think the important thing here is that you should understand that the consensus layer, like the protocol itself, thinks about validators in these like 32 ETH chunks, which is again, this sort of like principal deposit, you know, this like initial stake. Um, I gave it this phrase, consensus stake weight. Cause like, again, it's like, there are many things, uh, for example, if you are 
proposing in the network, right? So you're a validator, every validator is selected in proportion to their stake to propose a block. And uh, sort of the exact frequency is like your, your balance here divided by the total number of other balances, right? And so like, if there's like a thousand validators, you'd expect once every thousand slots to propose. Um, and essentially the idea here is that we want it, oh yeah, the idea is that there are many things like this in terms of shufflings and like assigning validators to different roles and duties that are proportional to their, their stake. And it actually turns out it's like far easier to reason about these in terms of like protocol security if you kind of treat every validator as having about the same weight. Um, otherwise, you would be like, oh, this other actor has like, you know, four times the stake weight of this one. And then like they propose four times as many blocks. Like that might not be good because then it's like, okay, they kind of have outsized influence on like what the chain looks like. And, their censorship was there. Anyways, the point is, is that, uh, you know, it, it's actually a really nice sort of design element that validators kind of all look the same in this way. And that's not to say though that validators can have different balances. There's basically a balance on chain and there's a separate balance, like an effective balance is what it's called that's tracked on chain as well. And in terms of like, uh, you know, figuring out these protocol rules, we use the effective balance, but then my actual balance could be higher than that or lower. So I'm going to start rambling about the intricacies of that. The bottom line is that uh, in order to actually withdraw, there are certain conditions that have to be met uh, before it's safe to do so from like a network security standpoint. So I gave some examples, like the very obvious one is like, uh, I'm validating, I'm a good validator, I'm doing my job. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to like, I don't know, Let's say, well, yeah, let's just say I want to stop validating. Like, I have something else to do. It's like too much effort for me. I just have a different hobby. Who knows? In that case, I can actually sign a message that says, Hey, I'm exiting at this time, broadcast it everywhere. And then if that gets on chain, then you end up going through this eventual process where you can then withdraw like your entire balance. This is what we might call a full withdrawal. Uh, I kind of hinted a second ago, you can end up with a balance over this sort of like consensus stake weight, this like consensus important value. Uh, and so then you actually might imagine withdrawing, you know, the differential over that. So let's say you have like 32.3 ETH because you've like, you know, have good attestations, uh, you know, a good attestation sort of history. And so the protocol rewards you for that. So now you have this diff, uh, you could imagine wanting to take that away because in terms of the protocol, again, everyone, you know, you should kind of squint and imagine every validator is like 32. <laughs> so if you have over, it's actually fine to, to pull it out of the system. And this is what we call a partial withdrawal. Uh, there's a distinction here I'm calling out. We'll get to at, towards the end of this talk uh, in more detail, but basically there's just like two different modes here of withdrawing. And there's other, there's many other pathways. The sort of like state space of being a validator is actually like kind of complicated because you basically like deposit, then you're activated, and then there's like an activation queue, and then you're going, and there can be an exit queue, but then also you can get slashed. So then it kind of like forks the whole thing. Anyways, point being is that uh, you know you eventually end up after some like very specific conditions are met uh, in this place where you can withdraw ETH. So. The high level point here is that uh, the consensus layer takes care of all of this. It's all encapsulated with respect to the execution layer that like there are protocol rules that consensus clients are following and enforcing. There you go. And that's all I have to say about that. So, right. And then the question is just like, okay, so we assume that this beacon chain thing is like, a, you know, uh, handling the safety of withdrawals. And so once it's deemed safe, like, what do you do? Um, and like, a really straightforward answer to that question is you just like write it down and you move on. And that's actually sort of the, the actual solution. Uh, I wrote down these little notes. So it's supposed to be a description of the beacon state, right? So there's there's this blockchain, uh, again, post-merge, there's just one blockchain, but you can imagine there's now this like sub-layer, the consensus layer that has its own state, the beacon state. And uh, it has a number of things. Uh, again, like if you want the full details, go to the consensus specs. It's all in there. But it has things like the genesis time of the chain. It has things like a, a list of every validator. It has things like a list of every balance. So again, when I said there's like the balances that are tracked, this is where they're tracked. Uh, the sort of favorite proposal right now is then we'll fork in, you know, and we'll get into exactly when we'll do this. But sometime after the merge, we will add a list to the state of withdrawals. 
Um, and these withdrawals are pretty straightforward. There's an index that just says basically in the sequence of all withdrawals, like um, you know where they where they occur. There's an amount, which is the actual amount of ETH that is you know available to be withdrawn. And then there's an address, and this address is an actual ETH1 address, like uh, an execution layer address. So address in the EVM, like you could go on ether scan right now and click around, right, in one of these addresses, uh, like a wallet address. So uh, when is the validator allowed to withdraw? So hopefully, you know, without going into too many details, you have some sense that there are some important like consensus rules that are being followed. The consensus protocol enforces these rules, and then it just basically, you know, secretes or emits these withdrawals whenever it's safe to do so. So now we say, okay, uh, if we have this like, you know, stream of withdrawals that's like emerging in the world, like how do we then tell, you know, from the consensus layer, how do we tell the execution layer uh, about them? And then again, yeah, the question of like, how do you actually do the ETH accounting? Uh, one minor aside, we're going to basically leave the consensus layer now and move pretty exclusively into the execution layer. Uh, but just before I did that, I did want to highlight one thing, which is that, uh, the way that we approach this whole issue of like launching this new proof of stake chain and emerging into the network, uh, if you're a validator already, then you mostly, you know, there's a few that actually have the new credentials, but most, most validators have these like quote old credentials, uh, and they're marked with this like version byte is zero, zero. And <clears throat> in order to execute a withdrawal, you need to have an address that points to, you know, some EVM account. Uh, so we have these this new withdrawal credential called a zero one credential. At least that's the version byte, and uh, there'll be a way to switch. And this is something you must do. Uh, there's no way to have accounts on the beacon chain or in the beacon state or anything like this. Uh, and so this is something you'll have to do. Um, the idea is that if you make new validators in the future, you can just default to these immediately. And if you want to see more about this, there's a PR that I linked here. 2855, uh, you can dig into the details. Okay, so we covered the first question, like when is it safe to withdraw? The consensus layer handles that. Now we're gonna talk about these next two, which is like effectively, you know, basically how do you process these withdrawals at the execution layer? And the big question here is like this whole notion of pull versus push. And so, those words are like, uh, you know, very leading. The idea is very much like, okay, uh, think about if you are sort of, you know, executing the withdrawal, then you have this huge pile of ETH, hopefully. And the question is like, do do I pull it from the the consensus layer to me, or do I have the consensus layer push it to me, right? And the intuition there is like, with push at least, is you can kind of have someone else do like some of the work, uh, and we'll see what that means in a second. Um, and then, yeah, there's the question of like, how do you actually credit uh, credit the ETH in the execution layer in the EVM state once once it's uh, been processed or received? Right. Okay. So I will talk about pool style because sort of historically that's uh, what we sort of looked at first. And uh, what that basically means is, okay, I come to Ethereum, like I come to the the chain, and I'm like, hey. Um, my validator was the ith withdraw on this list of them, and I'd like to like consume that. I would like to, you know, basically say, hey, this is mine. I want to pull the ETH again, pull style. I want to pull the ETH into some execution address. I choose. Um, so in order to do this, like if you just think about it, right? It's like there's there's something like the system, right? Like this, like the EVM doesn't know anything about the beacon chain or anything right now, right? So it needs to first off know like what this list of withdrawals even is, because it again it lives in this separate layer. And then also, it, this is actually important for, again, this like supply issue, this accounting issue. Uh, you need to track which withdrawals have been consumed because if you don't do that, then I could just like have a withdrawal for like 32 ETH. I could just keep cashing it, right? I could just loop forever. Um, and what that would do in practice is print ETH and lots of things start breaking. So we don't want that either. So these are two very important tasks. Uh, for the first one, um, we have some very convenient property that the beacon state uh, is described with this thing called SSZ. And what that means is that built in, it has this like Merkle tree structure. And that's important because then you can make proofs about things in the beacon state uh, if you know the state root. 
So to, I'll go back for a second. It gives a little, yeah. So again, I try to like jot down these notes about what the peaking state might look like. What this really means is that like each of these values is, if you imagine like a Merkle tree, I'll assume people are just familiar with that, but essentially imagine this tree structure, each of these fields on this list of notes is essentially a leaf in the tree or like it, it has, you know, some node, it, it makes some subtree in this, this full tree. And then what that means is that for any piece of data you want to pick in the entire state, you can make a Merkle proof from that piece all the way up to the root. And that would, for example, if you put in a list of withdrawals, include withdrawals. And so that's what I try to draw here. Uh, you know, every block, every slot actually even will change the, the beacon state. And so there'll be a new state root, call it R. Um, you see this drawing. I have this like one subtree on the left with like V1, V2, blah, blah, blah. Those are all like the validators. You could then have like the tree next to it, which is like all the balances of those validators. And then imagine there's like a tree appended to the end. And that's like the list of withdrawals. And then, uh, like I'm trying to suggest here, you can then make Merkle proofs. So imagine I wanted a proof that, like, you know, the second withdrawal was actually in this list. Well, I can I can do that. Um, if there's some way that the EVM knew about the root, then I could give you this proof along with the withdrawal, and you could, you know, well, actually within the EVM, you could authenticate that, uh, you know, this is all good. So this was the initial direction we went in, and in order to do this, you had to get this beacon state root into the EVM. And that was actually the point of this EIP 4788. Um, as we'll see, we're going with like this different uh, design choice. And so I think there's a lot less urgency of this EIP. I do want to call it out because there are a lot of other cool things that we can do um, around like staking pools and like, I don't know, just having access to finality. Like there's so many applications uh, that you can imagine in terms of being able to sort of trustlessly access the beacon state inside the EVM. Um, so I think I, I mean, I, I would definitely like to see the CIP at some point, uh, but again, it's been probably deprioritized, I think, given um, it's not necessarily required for the route that will end up going for the trolls. but I'll just call it out, it's important. Uh, so this is the first part was just saying like, hey, how do you even know if withdrawal is valid in Nevium? And then once you do, okay, so, there are two things. Uh, we need to know what the list is. And we just said that we would be able to make proofs about this list like if we had the beacon state roots. And then also we need to track, and this was part was important, right? Because otherwise you could print ETH, was knowing which receipts have been consumed. So uh, ultimately, there's just like a, a bit field, right? You could just imagine like a bunch of very tightly packed bits. And if you consume like the 20th receipt, then you mark the 20th bit. Then the question is like, where does this bit field live? Um, it could live in like a lot of different places, but uh, one that was like kind of interesting and like probably makes the most sense is to like somehow have it uh, in the EVM state. And basically what this means is that in order to access this thing, it would kind of look like a pre-compile. So we have these, these um, they're essentially different contracts, so to speak, in the EVM, but they have a special property that they actually execute native code rather than EVM bytecode. And the reason you do this is because they are more efficient this way. So you can basically say, okay, rather than doing like this, like kajillion operation, uh, you know, cryptographic addition in the EVM, you can basically say, okay, here's this like native implementation uh, that does the, the operation. Uh, and we can basically price it differently in terms of gas. Otherwise it'd be like way too expensive to do a lot of this stuff. So there's like some of our precompiles. Uh, an important bit though, is that they're all quote stateless, meaning like, you know, there's like a SHA-256 precompile, right? And this precompile doesn't track like the last thing you hashed or the, 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 the current hash, like it doesn't do anything. It just says, here's some bytes and you'll get some bytes back. And like, as someone using the EVM, I can basically make a call to that account uh, and do this operation, but I can't, you know, there, there's no, there's no state that like lives here. Whereas like, for example, if you had a regular smart contract in the EVM, it definitely has state. And that's in fact, like, uh, you know, one of the very special things about the EVM. Either way, um, there are no stateful precompiles. So there aren't any precompiles that are like uh, built in this way where they, they track state across implications. And so that would like kind of be this new thing. There's no prior precedent. Um, 
Another kind of name for this you might have seen is like system contracts. Basically, it's like this isn't just a user level thing. Like there's some special rules that we'd have to like apply to it uh, to track these these withdrawals. And so, either way, that's what it is. Uh, and then yeah, just to kind of round up the questions I had, the question then is like, okay, assuming we had a way to like make proofs about withdrawals, if the if they're valid or not, and then also we had a way to track which withdrawals have been consumed. The question is like, how do you credit the ETH in the EVM? Um, the thing is, is that like the ETH, uh, sort of you're, you're on the way in, there's like ETH that kind of disappears in the deposit contract and it's just, that's sort of like this black hole and then it actually ends up on the beacon chain, but then it has to come back to the beacon chain. So like the ETH has to come from somewhere, uh, the question is where. And again, it kind of depends on like the implementation you imagine, if there's like some system contracts, maybe you can just credit it kind of like uh, we do with the Coinbase today, right? So like with every block, there's like some block reward uh, that just comes out of nowhere. You could also imagine, and this was like some idea when uh, we were talking for a bit about basically having a withdrawal contract to mirror the deposit contract. And if we did that, some sort of like a very sort of <laughs> quick and dirty idea is you'd actually just put as much ETH as possible into the contract. And then uh, from there, it would, just like a norm, it would look like a normal contract transfer, which happens all the time. Um, it definitely would like require the least amount of like, for example, core developer work or like client work. But uh, you also then have this like very strange contract that has like, you know, an ungodly amount of ether and that complicates like supply questions and, and all sorts of things. And then, you know, if there's like a bug there, then that's not good. Uh, anyway, it was an idea. So just end to end, what does this all look like if we were to go this route of full style withdrawals? And essentially uh, what the user would say is, hey, uh, here's my withdrawal receipts at like index I in this list. It says I'm owed this much ETH and like also here's a proof. Uh, that would go to like the staple pre-compile thing, something like this. Uh, the system would say, okay, I'm gonna verify the proof against the beacon root that I have, because I have it somehow. Um, that looks good. Okay, I'm also gonna check my sort of my bid field, my like record of if this has been sort of redeemed already or not. If not, then I'm say I'm gonna say great, and I'm gonna credit you leave in the way that we decide. So that's sort of what it would look like. And the question is like, okay, like is this worth it? Uh, because there's this whole different sort of fork in the design of having withdrawals being pushed. And uh, I think really like again, you can read the slide, but essentially like the the benefits here is that this doesn't have that much to do. I think the only real thing you needed to do. Well, it depends on how you handle this, like say for compile, but there is actually not much that like we needed, you know, you would need to do um, in terms of client development and like actually writing new code, because really you could just imagine having the BQ state route uh, provided to the EVM and then the rest of it could be done in, in user space. There could actually just be a draw contract. And so what that means is now, you know, it's not unlike the GAT team, the Vesu team, the Tech team. Well, I'm jumping now, but you know, uh, who did I miss? Aragon, never mind. Point being is you don't have to have the execution clients like put all this stuff in. Uh, someone else could, right? You can have a different team that's like writing this contract. They could do formal verification of the thing, and that could all happen in parallel. So that was seemed like a very nice benefit. Uh, but then you look at like again the cost, the downsides to this. There's this whole new thing of like a stateful precompile. Uh, there's no prior precedent for that. We may have something like it one day, but uh, it's like definitely a new thing. And like, I think historically the source of most sort of consensus failures on test nets, for example, like when we go to test all of the new stuff we do, uh, a big a big source here is like EVM inconsistencies. So we don't necessarily want this like new EVM concept um, if we can avoid it. And also, yeah, scheduling is on the user. And so what that means is, um, you know, to do this, I am initiating an EVM transaction. So I have to like, there's gas, I have to pay for the gas. It also is taking, you know, that block space away from other people. So um, ultimately taking this all in stride, uh, it was decided that like, this wasn't the preferred path because we can basically uh, make it much simpler. So we'll look at that now. And this is the other thing I mentioned about pushed withdrawals. So, uh, the general concepts are the same. There's like the consensus layers tracking withdrawals. They're like in some structure on, in, on the chain. And then basically that gets 
in this case, pushed into the EVM where they can be processed. And so uh, the sort of the jumping off point here is to say, okay, rather than having a list of withdrawals, the Beacon State now has a queue of withdrawals and we actually make it the responsibility of the consensus layer to figure out when to dequeue. And so that's what I tried to draw with this little image here. If you imagine there's like, you know, withdrawals 222, 223, 224, there's like indices, for example, in this queue, you can imagine like within the next block, you like pop off two, 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 three, four, right? And then I tried to draw like an empty inbox and then you see them, sorry, you see them in the uh, the inbox on the bottom right there. And then still, you know, the CL still has these other withdrawals in the queue. And so, yeah, um, we have this, okay. So from there, we have these like, uh, we have these withdrawals pushed into the EVM and the base of the EVM can just say, okay, uh, great, um, you know, I know they've been validated by a consensus layer. And then I can say, okay, you know, let's just put this much data to this address. And again, these are basically the consequences. Uh, the execution layer doesn't need to track the consumer withdrawals because they're just provided out of its queue. Uh, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, reserving block space for them because they're now just like separately pushed into the EVM and they're just handled on their own. Uh, you don't have to like do the speaking state root thing. So we don't need the prior EIP I mentioned. You don't need the staple precompile. So like all this complexity is just kind of not necessary. So that's why this is the preferred path. Uh, again, it's like much simpler. Like I said, you basically, from the execution layer perspective, you just get these things. You are simply there just like balance increments and that's all you have to do. So for the end user, uh, you know, again, what's the end to end flow? What does this look like? As the user, you actually don't have to do anything uh, other than be a good validator that doesn't use a majority client. That's my tongue in cheek uh, call to improve that. And uh, as a system, yeah, you just, you basically the execution layer sees these withdrawals and you just apply like a, a few balance updates every block, let's say. So it's, it's much simpler, fewer moving parts for sure. Uh, you then have to like build out all of these like withdrawals and moving them across, but uh, I hope you'll see in a second that that's, that's simpler than like having to synchronize the state route and then having the end user make proofs and do all this. So we've covered these questions, which is like, again, when is it safe to withdraw? Well, the consensus layer will manage uh, this queue of them and basically just provide them to the execution layer when it's the right time. Uh, how is that signaled? Well, they're just, again, provided in a way that we'll see in a second. And then, yeah, the accounting actually is pretty straightforward. You can just add balances, much like we do with the Coinbase today. Uh, and that's something that we know how to do and it's simple and straightforward. And that gets us to the current status, which again, push style withdrawals, managed by the consensus layer, but then processed by the execution layer. Hopefully this sounds pretty straightforward. Um, we do have one last question, which is uh, how do you actually structure the withdrawals? And so this is something we like kind of glossed over, which is like, okay, these things are pushed somehow, but they do still need to have like some representation at like each stage of the pipeline. And the consensus layer, we're lucky there, there's like an SSD schema. So basically there's like, um, you know, by writing down these things that withdrawals, this is what I tried to do graphic on the right here where it says withdrawal and these amounts, like when you, when you write this down, there's like a specific serialization that we get. Uh, so that's really helpful. And let me jump back to here. So then there's now some interface between the consensus layer and the execution layer and I called it a free parameter. The idea is like, as long as you get the data across, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. Um, you know, there's some JSON RPC that we have and you can go look at the spec, not a huge, huge deal. This last bit is a little tricky because we then also want to have representation for withdrawals in the execution layer. And the reason why is because we want the execution layer, like it's sort of, it's, well, not sort of, it is a design goal of the merge and this general architecture to have the execution layer and the execution clients be able to function somewhat independently from a consensus layer and consensus clients. And so, for example, uh, let's say the consensus layer is like going along and like setting the head of the chain and then it needs like some, some execution state, right? To like validate a payload or something. 
Um, that may end up turning into a request to the execution client to then go like sync some fork it didn't know about or something, right? And basically you don't want these two clients to have to be like blocked on each other. Um, they should have enough autonomy to like go and basically get a full view of the network um, as desired. So what that means is that you may end up passing around, uh, you know, um, well, you at least have representation of withdrawals in these blocks that like the execution client would have because it might be like processing them off on some fork without necessarily going to the consensus client and being like, hey, uh, you know, what was the withdrawal 223 or 224? Like, I don't know, right? So we need some way to, to describe that. And uh, this is another sort of like design decision point that we came to. Uh, and again, there's sort of like a quick and dirty solution. There's also like a much cleaner solution. Uh, we're going with a much cleaner solution, but one way we could have done this was basically there's a notion of transaction types from EIP 2718. And for example, listeners are almost certainly familiar with EIP 1559. The way that that is written is there's actually a type two transaction that's different from type one or type well, zero. There's like a legacy type. Anyway, uh, the point is, is that we could have made a new transaction type and just like shove the withdrawal information into that. So it would work. Uh, it's not very clean though, especially from like a conceptual perspective because uh, these things aren't user level transactions. If anything, they're like system operations, which is the language we're, we'll get to. Um, there was an EIP to go down this road, 4863, I linked to it here. Uh, and yeah, you know, we could go find the Alcor devs call, but essentially we like talked about this and the general consensus was like, hey, Let's, uh, let's not abuse transactions in this way. And so instead, you don't touch user level transactions. We have this new type of thing called an operation. Um, and yeah, that's as specified today, EIP 4895, where things are at. Um, again, the benefits here, you don't mix the concerns. It's like the, the withdrawals are firewall off completely. You don't have to worry about like, okay, is this a withdrawal or is this an EVM transaction? Um, an important kind of differ differentiating point here is that uh, EVM transactions, or sorry, the withdrawals don't touch the EVM at all. They touch the EVM state, but there's not like any bytecode, for example, that would run. So it, it actually makes a lot of sense to like have them be this separate thing. It's easier to code, easier to review, and all of that. Um, there's also a bonus point, which is that there's actually some symmetry to having these like system level operations uh, in terms of how like a lot of optimistic roles are structured. Uh, so you can like reuse a lot of the ideas, the code, just the concepts uh, in these different domains all with the L2, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so 4895, uh, that's the IP at the execution layer for withdrawals. I did want to touch briefly on partial withdrawals before we wrap up with these slides. I mentioned this a second ago. The idea is that if you recall for the protocol, a validator is like something like 32 ETH. Um, the question is like, okay, if I have more than that, which I can accrue just by doing my job and like accumulating rewards, like what happens? Um, in terms of protocol security, this extra ETH is like actually not really adding much. And so then the question is like, okay, like, well, if it's just sitting there, that's not capital efficient, like we should be able to do something about that. And so this is what we mean when we say a partial withdrawal is the idea is that every so often um, the beacon chain, well, and this is implementation, is that the beacon chain will look at the entire validator set and just say, oh, if you have more than your 32, then we're going to basically make a withdrawal for you. That will then go into this queue I was just talking about. Sorry, and everything else is the same from there. So um, yeah, there's a PR. We're working some of the details. Again, the idea is it's like this automatic process where you can just imagine, again, this background thing that's like running and just slowly scanning through the entire set, circling back through, scanning through the entire set, you know, doing this. And then every time it finds a validator with excess ETH in terms of consensus security, it'll just make a withdrawal for the additional amount. And that ends up getting pushed to the EVM to your address. Wait, do we? Okay. Sorry. Um, great. This is the last slide. TLDR. There are consensus layer changes to support withdrawals. Uh, there's execution layer changes uh, in the form of the IP 4895. Because this thing touches several layers of the stack, uh, there's not like necessarily like we can't put it all on one EIP. That's like just not how the EIP process works. 
Uh, similarly, we don't have like a space to like write down all these consensus changes and then also link down execution layer changes. So sort of a stopgap solution is this idea of a meta spec. So uh, I have this link here to this meta spec I've written that kind of has like a written description of everything I just went through and then also um, links to the actual specs, both for the consensus layer, the execution layer, and then also the engine API, which is the interface between the two layers. So definitely go there if you want to dive into more of the details. Um, yeah, and then just like some takeaways as a validator, uh, the only thing you really have to do is swap from your zero zero credentials if you have them to zero one. And then from there, it should be a pretty straightforward automatic process uh, when the right conditions are met and then your ETH will just appear at your ETH1 address I'm choosing. And of course the question is always when, so, uh, this EIP and also the consensus changes are now CFI for Shanghai. CFI is considered for inclusion. Shanghai is the merge after, the, sorry, the fork after the merge. And um, yeah, so basically the merge will happen hopefully very soon. And then from there, uh, you know, the next fork that we can pull off will have these changes and these features will go live. Um, I left a note to like the Shanghai sort of planning doc if anyone wants to see what else is on on the plate, um, but 48.95 is definitely one of them. And I believe that is it. So um, yeah, if anyone had any questions or I think there were some questions from quote the audience, the broader internet, I'm happy to talk about those. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing talk. The presentation was awesome and the explanation that you have provided. I think it's going to be helpful for many people who are even watching it for the first time, like uh, if they are learning about the beacon chain and the POS process for the first time. So thank you for explaining these concepts in such a simple way, really appreciate it. I know um, there were multiple options available. You did talk about all those proposals which were there, the pull and the push. And then we came up, came down to uh, EIP 4895 for CFI in Shanghai. This means that this is one of the best proposals those were available. And in my mind, it is like the missing key to the fully functional POS and Ethereum. Um, though you have already answered most of the questions, Still, uh, we have a couple of more questions for you uh, that we have collected from the Reddit Eat Staker community and some other places. So I'm gonna just pick uh, one by one for you. The first one is coming from a Reddit user, C. Garnett. Um, his question is, I seem to remember that the people who ask, who stake earlier will also be able to withdraw after the Shanghai fork. First to stake are the first to queue for withdrawals. Do you know where I can find the documentation or am I mistaken? <clears throat> right, so again, this gets back to security and like uh, when it's okay to uh, actually withdraw. So the, I mean, the short answer is that uh, basically yes, although it's conditional on you exiting, right? Um, or I suppose also if we have like some partial withdrawals, then yeah, you'll probably, uh, if you're earlier in the set, you know, by index, then you'll get, you'll, you know, the process will get to you before others. Um, but yeah, essentially what can happen is uh, if you're validating, you're like, okay, I've been doing this for like a year or whatever, like I'm, I'm done, I wanna take a break. You can do that. You would probably issue an exit. And then with the exit, uh, you would then go into this exit queue. And again, this is where you end up with, a very critical piece for proof of stake security is that you can't like it wouldn't work if you could suddenly have like half of the set exit because then it wouldn't be accountable. And so the way that you keep it accountable is basically you you have this like delay in between when they exit and when or when they you know when they want to exit and when it actually takes effect. Um, and the idea is that the ETH is your your stake is still at risk this whole time. So uh, if you wanted to, for example, like move that process along, you know, like if you wanted to get to, to withdraw faster, then you'd have to like get into the exit queue earlier. Um, and that's something you could do. Um, I think that's what they're referring to. Yeah, I, I think so too. Like uh, the, because people have been waiting for a long time for such proposal to come in and they be able to enable. So it's one of the most curious question, like 
when and how we will be able to withdraw it. Thank you. Right. And yeah, and I will say this is why there's there's a lot of uh, desire to have something like partial withdrawals, because if you didn't have this, then you would have sort of this like thunder and stampede problem where like suddenly everyone needs to exit fully, like and then you just clog the execute. Um, so this is the idea of the partial withdrawals is that you have like if there is sort of extra ETH that is not required for security, then it's uh, a way to think about it is like basically skipping this execute or at least having a, a separate queue for the withdrawals. Um, yeah, so that'll be exciting to see too. Right. And now that you have mentioned it, it, it really make a lot of sense of having partial withdrawal earlier. It was it was my question as well, like, why do we want to have it in the first place? But it makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you. My next question is related to the withdrawal flow. Um, so it is about the uh, timing and the MEV impact. The EIP suggests the withdrawals in a block are processed after any user level transactions are applied. How do you think withdrawal processing before and after any user level transaction affect the MEV searching situation? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So uh, I think the short answer is that it doesn't really matter. Um, there's actually some interesting discussion about this uh, on the Fellowship of ETH Magicians, which is a forum we have for EIP discussion and different things like this. So if you go find the, the FEM post for EIP 4895, uh, there's actually some conversation about this exact point. Um, the choice is, okay, uh, if we do have these withdrawals, either, well, yeah, really this is more for the push design, but either way, you have these withdrawals. And so the question is like, okay, when do you actually process them with respect to the other user level transactions? Um, even when we were going to like do the strange thing of like making a new 2718 type transaction, uh, it would still make sense to basically block them all together and have them at one place or the other. And that's really just because you still want the execution client to be able to like verify, but you want both clients really, you want them both to verify that like um, everything is in order and it matches what's in this state. And anyway, point being is you want them batched together for efficiency reasons and the question then is, you have this batch, do you put it before all the other user transactions or at the end? Um, and you could probably go either way. Um, I will say that if it goes after, that's how we handle the Coinbase right now. And so there's some symmetry there. It's like fewer like differences to remember when you're trying to like, you know, reason about the protocol. So that's nice. Um, yeah, that, there, there's like a bit more to say, but that's that's the highlight. Um, it doesn't really matter. There's like some weak preference for after because that's just how we handle the Coinbase and these things kind of look like Coinbase operations. Right, and these MEV bots are getting smarter and smarter, not only front runner, now back runner is also a problem. So <laughs> we, we guys have to keep struggling with that. Right, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Um, my next question is related to uh, the security consideration. You did mention about the when withdrawal as like one of the key features like for security consideration. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that that you think may need research that can delay the proposal to be included in Shanghai? I mean, is there anything of like very high security that you might want to consider? Nothing comes to mind. Uh, I do not think we would have the CFI status if people felt this wasn't in a place where it essentially just needs to be implemented and then shipped. Um, again, there certainly are security considerations, but they've already been baked into like the way that we are designing, developing, and shipping the beacon chain, the consensus layer, all of that. Um, yeah, there aren't any like huge open-ended questions. If anything, there, there were potential questions, but they've been answered. And that was sort of this like, you know, when I walked us through the, this sort of design space with this talk, that was the process we've already gone through was to like answer those questions. And so, um, yeah, there's like nothing, there's nothing like suddenly that would pop out of nowhere that I'm aware of that would be like, oh yeah, this isn't gonna work. We have to like start from scratch, any of that. Um, yeah, should be ready to go. I hope so. Generally, a core proposal, and especially when it comes to dealing with money uh, or or the ether, people worry about like 
how careful are we? And I really do trust on the Ethereum client developers team. If they have put it into CFI, that means a lot and might have considered whatever can be considered at this stage, maybe in later stage, if anything is identified, may require further research. Right. Yeah, definitely. And like that was part of, you know, part of this process I've tried to like describe was like, for example, I, I we had at one point this idea of like, we just make this like staple or this like system contract that has just like, you know, max way in it, you know, just like as much ETH as can be represented in a smart contract. And like, uh, if there's a bug, then like, that's very bad because <laughs> suddenly you can drain, you know, more ETH than exists and then we don't we definitely have to like roll that back and that would be an entire huge mess. Uh, so anyway, you're right. It's like critically important to like maintain these supply invariants. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think the core devs are certainly like sympathetic to that as well, right? Um, and we can see that in the choices we made to get to this point. Right, right. My, um, my next question is about EIP 4895 that we discussed today. According to one of the EIP editors, uh, this EIP, EIP could be implemented even if the OMAN list is not empty and there is no dependency. So I suppose um, the request here from the editors is to consider this proposal to not include the mention of the OMAR list as well as also uh, the mention of EIP uh, 3675, because it seems like these are too much information, TMI, and may not be needed for, um, you know, for uh, general implementers. This is good piece of information, uh, but may not be directly related to uh, keeping it as a part of a proposal. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Um... I saw similar comments and it's on my to-do list to go update the IP to make those edits. Um, I don't think, I don't think they're terrible there, but I hear the argument that, you know, for this EIP, we want it to be super polished and be like a very particular thing where it is just those exact changes required to implement the feature. Um, so in light of that, then, um, yeah, the, the the comments you're discussing are like almost like helpful hints or like an implementation guide, uh, you know, in that direction. And so they could be removed and it would still all be good. So I, I believe that is the way forward and it's, it'll happen soon. Good to hear that. I'm not sure if there is any uh, uh, rules uh, for this kind of information being added to EIP, but it is always good to have a cleaner and smaller EIPs. It's not only helpful to editors, but for other people to you know, understand in a simple way. Thank you. My last question for you is, um, is something that I have been uh, trying to understand. You did mention about the changes that are being brought by this proposal and uh, two of the most important changes are like addition of withdrawal route to the header and the other one is the addition of withdrawal data to the block, block body. So these are two different parts, one for core changing the consensus rule, one for networking. Why not to have two separate proposal? Why do we want to have it bundled together in one proposal? Right. So uh, kind of like I was saying with the previous question, uh, some of this is like down to the actual like sort of syntax of the IPs. And I'm very open to like changing the IP to like fit more in line with what, for example, the IP editors expect. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely room to split some of that out. Uh, I think in terms of like communicating, because like, again, there was this like history and this moment of a process of working through different designs and it was helpful just to have like one EIP that did everything, you know, and just like had it all in one place. Um, certainly it makes sense to revisit now, especially that we've all agreed to like the general approach, like how, yeah, what should go to the EIP? How does that look like? There are some things that are networking level concerns. So again, also on my to-do list was to like make some change like the dev P2P specs uh, for this reason. And yeah, um, if certainly if there's desire from the editors or others to like pull those pieces out of the IP itself because they live somewhere else, then I think it totally makes sense and it'll happen. Yeah, I think so. It will be really helpful because when we are having it into two separate EIPs, uh, if something is changed for one particular 
you know piece of uh, the code there that will be affecting only one proposal and moreover networking eip i'm not sure if that needs to go on the devnet when they when it is getting prepared for the uh, for any uh, hard fork so it will be easier for even implementing uh, implementation team right I'll yeah 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 that makes sense yeah 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 so now we're contract eip uh we'll see i actually am not sure how the how you get from the stack of networking IPs we have to like the dev p2p repo, but I can look into that and then uh, then separately, right? We'll have like sort of the the I can't say consensus because that's now refers to something much bigger, but uh, you know the state transition logic for the change. Well, thank you, thank you for the consideration, and I I can see that it's almost time to wrap up. Anything else you want to share with our viewers related to the proposal or in general? Hmm. I guess if I have a minute, then I will take it to say test the merge. If you are willing and or able uh, to provide some like technical skills in terms of security or testing or review, even if you don't have like sort of really, uh, you know, technical skills on that front, you could even just like run nodes, right? Like even just participating in like the kiln test nets, um, that would really go a long way to help flush out some of the things. Uh, that's, I think now where a lot of the core developers and co are, are focusing their efforts. And uh, that's the area I think that we feel like, you know, even today, like needs the most attention. So you're watching this because you like are a validator and you wanted to learn how this will work. Like this is great, it's coming up, uh, but there's work to do in the meantime. So uh, run some more notes, file bug reports. If there's even documentation you can, uh, you know, you can improve, then by all means do that. And every little bit adds up. So test the merge. <laughs> Definitely test the merge. That's really important right now because as soon as we are done with merge, then when then only we can expect this proposal to be coming up with Shanghai. So help us. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, uh, for sharing this information. Um, and uh, I must congratulate the way that you have started documenting the meta spec. It is even helpful before we actually get to the proposal because the way it is explained there, that provides the entire context, the history that, okay, fine, even if we are not going through the full process, it explains that it was there at some point of time. So I think that's a good uh, best practices kind of thing that maybe other authors can follow and help us go along the journey. Yes, well, thank more you. context I hope is always very helpful. <laughs> yeah. It is. It definitely is. And when it is written in such a simple word that even non-technical people can understand, then only I think that people will be able to accept the proposal, right? And start discussing it. Yeah. Thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, having me. So um, I know the information shared today is really exciting for the staker community who have been waiting for for one such proposal for a very long time to be able to realize their award. So thank you once again for sharing this. And um, um, I know the proposal is already in CFI and my hope with the release of this episode is to help the proposal receive more feedbacks before it is added to the DevNet. And on this note, thanks to all our YouTube viewers for watching and sharing your feedback with comments. Check out description for related links along with guest Twitter handles follow. If you like this episode, hit like and share to increase the reach. We want all this information to be shared with, with the community more and more so though they be able to participate not only to the merge testing, but also in, in the process of helping out a proposal to get into the next status. So please join the discussion, add discussion to link provided in the description. Should you have any question on this or any other proposal, let us know in comment section or share us with our ETH Cat Holders Discord. Subscribe to Ethereum Cat Holders YouTube channel if you haven't done it already. See you next time with another interesting talk. Till then, keep watching, keep sharing your love with Ethereum Cat Holders. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.